All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody to this fellows lecture this afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, joining us to hear this talk by Dr. Andrew Mesmer entitled Spain's Forgotten Reformation. Um, my name is Robin Harris and I'm the communications director here at the Davenant Institute. The Davenant Institute, our mission is to renew the contemporary church by recovering the wisdom of classical pro Protestantism. We do this in a number of ways. Um, we publish books, including many translations and modernizations of forgotten works of the Reformation. We also have a, a residential study center uh, in, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in South Carolina. And we host lots of events there and we invite people to come study and pray and have discipleship and uh, build community who, uh, with people who share our project. And then we also run Davenant Hall, a full graduate level college where we bring in prominent scholars and academics to teach classes on biblical studies, philosophy, systematic theology, ethics, literature, and more. Um, so one of the things that we do regularly to give people a taste of Davenant Hall is that we invite some of uh, our scholars in our network to present some of their research and expertise to the public. And that's what these monthly fellows lectures are. Uh, so today's lecture is by uh, Dr. Andrew Mesmer. Dr. Mesmer holds a PhD in theology and religious studies from Evangelical Theological Faculty in Belgium, where he completed his thesis on the word Maranatha as it occurs in 1 Corinthians 16.22. He is now the academic dean of Seville Theological Seminary, an invited professor at the Interna International Theological Faculty in Barcelona, an affiliated researcher with the Evangelical Theological Faculty and the editor of the World Evangelical Alliance's Spanish journal called Review of the Evangelical Theology. Since 2016, he has been full-time engaged in researching and teaching the Spanish Protestant Reformation. Uh, he has published two books and several articles on that topic. He is married to his wonderful wife, Lindsay, and together they have five small children. So the format for today's lecture is that Dr. Mesmer will lecture for about 45 minutes and then we'll take a three minute break and then I will lead a time of question and answer. Um, so feel free to drop your questions into the uh, Q&A box on your screen throughout the lecture um, and do use that Q&A feature rather than the chat function um, because it's easier for us to keep track with them all being in one place. We don't want anyone's questions being lost. Uh, so with that, thank you, Dr. Mesmer, for being here today, and feel free to take things from here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. And um, before I get started, I'd like to do a, a quick commercial. Um, <clears throat> as Robin said, I am the uh, academic dean here at uh, Seville Theological Seminary. <clears throat> if you speak Spanish and you would like to study the Spanish Prize and Reformation in depth, I invite you to come study with us. We have an affordable program and it's an in-depth study of church history, uh, which uh, concentrates on the Spanish Prize and Reformation. Um, I'm also the uh, editor of the World Evangelical Alliance's uh, Spanish journal. So if you are looking to publish uh, in English or Spanish, we have a good working relationship with the English journal. And um, if you would like to publish in Spanish, we would be very interested in um, considering your, your article. We publish on all topics related to scripture, church history, systematic theology, world religions, and contemporary issues. So there's my uh, brief um, commercial out of the way, and let's get into tonight's topic, Spain's Forgotten Reformation, the first hundred years. <clears throat> Not sure what you know about the Reformation in Spain, but I think it has been forgotten by many people. Um, from my perspective, as I read uh, books dedicated to the 16th century uh, Protestant Reformation, uh, many times there will be chapters dedicated to Germany, to Switzerland, to England, to France, uh, and nothing on Spain. Uh, very, very many even academic works dedicated to the topic don't even treat it. So uh, I consider it uh, an honor, a privilege to be able to be the one uh, for most of you to, to um, introduce you to this wonderful, tragic, but beautiful reformation. So let me just tell you what uh, some of my goals are for tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to inform you, as I just said, uh, I'm going to share with you uh, the story of the Spanish Reformation. But uh, for some of you, I would like to uh, recruit you 
uh, we need help. We are right now rediscovering the Spanish Reformation. Um, every month, every other month, we are finding new documents that have been lost. They are lost and hidden in uh, libraries around Europe and around the world. Um, and we are finding them. And I'll tell some of the stories about how that happens tonight. Uh, if you are interested uh, in writing uh, your PhD and you're looking for a topic, if you want to get into uh, Reformation theology, but from a new perspective, if you want to serve the Spanish speaking world, um, if you're interested in the lesser known Reformation, well, the Spanish Reformation is for you. Uh, thirdly, I'd like to inspire you. Um, the Spanish Reformation is beautiful. It had its own unique character to it. And uh, I have coined the phrase the fourth way of Protestantism, uh, the first two being the well known uh, Lutheran Reformed ways, and then the famous uh, third way of Anglicanism, trying to bridge the gap between Geneva and Wittenberg. Uh, as I have studied uh, the Spanish Protestantism for the last several years, uh, I have seen the same ecumenical spirit, uh, the third way Anglicanism, but an even broader spirit, uh, one that uh, was reluctant, reluctant to um, cut off uh, certain uh, strands of the Anabaptist movement. And so it was an even broader movement uh, than the Anglican uh, tradition. And um, so it's a, it's a fourth way. It's, it's truly orthodox, fully orthodox, fully historical, self-consciously so, but also fully focused on love and the unity of Christ's church. And so maybe uh, the Spanish Protestant uh, Reformation can inspire us to look at church unity from a new perspective. Well, when we start talking about the Spanish Reformation, we automatically come into the problem of a definition. Where do we draw the line? Uh, this is something that we face uniquely in the Spanish Reformation that uh, those studying the Reformation in Germany and other countries don't face. Um, where do we draw the line? Excuse me. We have uh, evangelical Catholics in Spain. Uh, do we count them as Protestants, semi-Protestants? <clears throat> what about the great influence from Erasmus? Uh, are, where do we draw the line with, with uh, Erasmians? Uh, when do they become Protestant? <clears throat> what about people who just critique the Roman Catholic Church of the time? Are they Protestant? Um, we also have a phenomenon that is also found in Italy and in the Spanish Netherlands called the, Nic uh, the Nicodem Nicodemite uh, phenomenon. Um, that is people who are, this was a term coined by John Calvin, people who are externally Roman Catholic, but internally, privately, secretly Protestant. Uh, how do we identify these people? So there are some difficulties in defining what exactly are we talking about, but a, a working definition, when I'm re talking about Spanish Protestants, Spanish Protestantism, uh, we could say that a working definition would be <clears throat> Protestants who are from or who ministered in Spain, uh, who would have continued to live and minister in Spain as Protestants if they could have done so. And so that is uh, a broad definition, um, but that's also something that we have to do in Sp uh, Spanish Reformation studies, because uh, if we didn't, we wouldn't have anything to study. There is uh, so little um, clearly, uh, clearly Protestant literature that was written in Spain by Protestants for other Protestants, uh, that we, we wouldn't have anything to study. So we take a broad approach. Anyone who, if they could have lived here, they would have ministered here, they would have wrote here, they would have been Protestants, they would have started churches. Uh, we include them as part of our Reformation. Uh, so <clears throat> in order to help introduce you to this, I'm taking a chronological approach. I'm not gonna talk about people or events or places. We're gonna look at the story of Spanish Protestantism for the first hundred years because I really want you to see how things developed over this century. <clears throat> and I'm going to make a promise to you, which is very hard for me, but I will try to pronounce Spanish words with a thick American accent. And I have been speaking Spanish for uh, over a decade now. I live in Spain and uh, it is very hard to do this, but I've actually been practicing this and I, I, I hope to be able to help you. Um, so that's my service to you. <clears throat> okay.
Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and begin uh, with before Luther, and let's look at the Alumbrado roots of Spanish Protestantism. We can actually uh, find the, the, the start to the Alumbrado movement in Spain in the year 1509, and we know this from the Inquisition documents that were kept. Uh, very meticulously so, uh, started actually by a woman named Isabel de la Cruz. What is the background of this movement? Well, it's a mixture of converso Christianity. Converso means Jewish Christian. So there's a, uh, wherever we look uh, with the Alumbrado movement, over and over again, we find people who have a Jewish background. In 1492, the great, the famous edict went out in all of Spain. If you live in Spain, you have to be uh, Catholic, or what we would later call Roman Catholic, and uh, many Jews fled and many Jews stayed. Those Jews who stayed and converted, they were, they were called conversos. <clears throat> so we have a mixture of converso, Jewish Christianity, spirituality, with medieval mysticism, and specifically from the Franciscan uh, tradition. And so with these two uh, streams of spirituality, this forms the background of uh, the Alumbrado movement. Um, maybe in the question and answer time, we can be a little more specific about the Alumbrado movement. There were various um, uh, uh, subgroups to that uh, large group, but uh, basically speaking, when we talk about the characteristics, we're talking about the following, uh, the following characteristics. Uh, a stress on mental prayer, an emphasis on personal Bible reading, interpretation, and relationship with God. So very interior, very uh, very focused on my own, to use today's language, my own personal walk with the Lord. Um, <clears throat> they downplay the importance of the external church and they emphasize the importance of internal religion. They focused on Pauline Christianity and faith alone. And they, uh, as I've already hinted at, they had a, a, a notable female leadership. Um, so Isabel de la Cruz is the one who uh, can be credited with, with founding the Alumbrado movement, uh, and Maria de, Cas de, de Casaya, another noted uh, Alumbrado uh, from central Spain. And as I've thought about the kind of sociological, also doctrinal, uh, uh, equivalent, modern day equivalent of the Alumbrado movement, as I've kind of cast the idea back and forth in my mind, not that it's a, a perfect illustration, but um, it's it would have been something similar to a, a charismatic or Pentecostal movement, or maybe even uh, an evangelical movement, or just taking all of those and pushing them all into one word, um, and that would be kind of the, the Alumbrado. There's all sorts of of stuff going on there, but it was it was defined over against the Roman Catholic Church of its day. So maybe that'll help you categorize, you know, what what I'm talking about uh, with the Alumbrados. So this is where where it was before Luther. Now we can talk about Erasmus and Luther and entering Spain in the 1510s and 1520s. First, Erasmus, his works begin to be translated into Spanish in 1516. And according to one uh, Spanish historian, in no other country did he enjoy such fame as in Spain. So he was very well received, especially for the first decade or so. But in 1527, there was a famous conference in the city in Northern Spain, <clears throat> which we'll return to later called Valladolid. And via the lead, uh, in this conference, uh, we have <clears throat> two schools of thought coming together to debate Erasmus and if he's good or if he should be banned from the country. From Salamanca and via the lead, that is to say from basically northern and kind of northwestern Spain, we have uh, scholastics, that is to say conservative theologians, and they come up and right down the line, they say Erasmus should be banned. <clears throat> and then you have from central Spain, from the University of Alcalá de Henares, you have people coming up, and they are uh, liberals, they're humanists, and they, down, down the line, they say Erasmus is good. There was, one, there was one, one from one of the schools who flip-flopped, but other than that, it was down the line, two schools of thought coming together. The result of this uh, conference was a stalemate. Uh, he was neither endorsed nor 
forced to uh, out of Spain, that, that his works that is, but he was no longer a neutral figure. Um, his followers were put on watch or put on alert. And some people could sense that a tide, uh, that a shift uh, was, was occurring. As far as Luther is concerned, <clears throat> his works to begin to be translated into Spanish in 1520, but he had a much cooler reception in Spain. Although his works were translated in 1520, they were pro prohibited by the Inquisition in 1521. So before we go on, let's just take stock of where we're at. As far as the chronolo chronologically speaking, the, the, the influence is coming into Spain. First, we have the Alumbrado movement, then we have Erasmus, and then we have Luther. But in terms of influence, uh, and this may be controversial to some of the uh, scholars uh, in Spanish Reformation studies, but I think it's fair to say that we could order them in the following manner, that the person who had the, the greatest influence on this, uh, this movement, this broad movement, um, would probably be Erasmus. He had the, 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 the strongest uh, influence, the humanist uh, influence. And then after that, the Alumbrado spirituality. And then finally, Luther. And then by, th by this time, some reformed works start coming into Spain. In the 20s and 30s, we have works by uh, Zwingli, for example, coming into Spain. So um, in the 20s and 30s, the, this is um, the University of Alcalá de Henares. This was the brainchild of Cardinal Francisco Jiménez de Cisneros. You've probably heard of Cisneros, and this is the facade of the university. I've been there several times. This is actually where the first Bible was printed, uh, not published. It was uh, kept privately there, but it was where it was published, uh, the, 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 the um, Complutense Polyglot. Uh, wonderful story, wonderful, wonderful work there. So Cisneros was a faithful Roman Catholic, but he was also uh, a humanist. And his vision for this university was to combine uh, the conservative three-way school. And the three-way school in this time was the schools of Thomism, Scotism, and Nominalism. And this, you can think of Middle Age scholasticism. That was the, the, the three ways, and he wanted to combine that with the best of humanism and a renewed emphasis on scripture. And that was his goal to combine conservative scholasticism with liberal uh, biblicism, if you like. Uh, and this ended up becoming a hotbed for Spanish Protestantism. Now we still have questions about <clears throat> uh, especially the, the professors and the lectures and what was going on there because we, we just don't know what was going on there. What we do know is that many students um, would later become Protestant leaders uh, throughout Spain and, and beyond. So I know many of these names don't mean much to you right now, but I, I will talk about them as the lecture continues. Listen to these names of everyone who, who had contact with this university. Juan de Valdez, Mateo Pascual, Pedro Alejandro, uh, Juan uh, Hill. Um, his uh, Latinized name is Dr. Ahidio. You may have heard of him. Uh, Constantino de la Fuente, uh, Francisco de Vargas, Juan Diaz, Agustin de Casaya, and uh, Miguel Monterde. Now he's uh, maybe a more of a humanist than Protestant, but uh, and many other influential uh, Spanish theologians studied her as well. You may have heard of some of these names. Bartolome de Carranza, later the Archbishop of Toledo. Uh, Juan de Avila, famous uh, uh, apostle to southern Spain. Uh, Ignacio de Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. Francisco de Osuna, a very famous alumbrado. They will all study here as well. One quick word about Juan de Valdez and his time here. <clears throat> he studied here in the latter half of the 1520s. In 1529, he will publish uh, a catechism called the Dialogue of Christian Doctrine. It's a, published in many, translated into many different languages, but he published it in January 1529, writing it in 1528. Now, I've read his catechism a number of times, and as I try to be as fair as possible, at times I read it and I think, uh, this seems to be like written by a Roman Catholic. I think a Roman Catholic could read this and not have too many problems reading it. And then I read it, 
And I think this sounds like a Protestant catechism. I, I think a Protestant could read this and not have any problems with this. I was speaking with a Anglican bishop one time who was a, a great admirer of, of Juan de Valdez. And he said he thinks it's the perfect catechism because both traditions can read it. Do with that what you like. But if this is a Protestant uh, catechism, and it seems to be, it was uh, immediately... Um, uh, censored by the Inquisition, but if this was the, uh, a Protestant catechism, this means that it was the first Protestant catechism ever published. Um, uh, Martin Luther's catechism will come out um, about a half a year later in 1529, uh, making Juan de Valdez, um, his, his catechism, the first. Um, let me tell you real quickly the story of this catechism. As I said, it was condemned by the Inquisition, and it was lost for several centuries. There is no historical record of anyone reading it. Um, and the only copy, one copy left, was found in the National Library of Lisbon. It was found by a, a researcher in 1925. So for about, uh, you know, three or four hundred years, this it's a beautiful, wonderful catechism, completely lost and rediscovered less than a hundred years ago. So when I say that we are rediscovering our reformation, that's, that's what I mean. We are actually rediscovering it. We find things in libraries all the time and they turn out to be classics. This is a spiritual classic if you haven't read it. Um, unfortunately, the party had to come to an end. His uh, Cisneros, his vision, of uniting such diverse streams of thought. It was just too much. It was too diverse. And the university had to choose between being conservative, following the three ways, three schools, medieval Christianity, or liberalism. And as time progressed, uh, as debates went on with Protestant, between Protestants and Catholics, uh, the Council of Trent became, uh, started uh, approaching uh, some influential professors uh, who were conservative, such as Domingo de Soto and Melchor Cano. Um, the university took a decidedly conservative uh, turn, and most humanists and Protestants end up uh, fleeing uh, Alcala. So let me talk about Alcala's diaspora. Now let me give a, a disclaimer here. I'm not saying that um, any Spaniard who ever left Spain is a, is, is a direct result of Alcala's conservative turn. I'm, I'm not saying that. Um, and it wasn't a momentary thing. It wasn't uh, some edict was, was uh, promulgated and then in mass there was this huge exodus. But over a, you know, a few years period there, people start leaving Alcala and, and a lot of people that are in, the, in, in exile uh, or fugitives, they, they end up, uh, they have some connection with Alcala. So um, <clears throat> Protestants, humanists and Protestants, they, they've lost their safe haven in Alcala. So let me just share a few of the places where they went. <clears throat> One was Paris. This group goes back to the 1530s. Its leader was Juan Murillo. He has an interesting story because he was actually a Roman Catholic theologian at the first sessions of Trent. And after the first sessions, he decided that he was uh, reformed uh, and he uh, became the leader of this group, not only in Paris, but as we'll see in a moment uh, of Frankfurt. A long list of names of, um, of Spanish Protestants at Paris. I won't read them here. If you like, I can tell you who they are in the question and answer time. Uh, another important group was in Naples. It's just off the view of our map here, uh, down there uh, in the south of Rome. Naples actually belonged to the crown, Spanish crown at this time. This is where Juan de Valdez will go in 1535 and Mateo Pascual will follow him there. Uh, this is interesting because Valdez will attract a large following uh, uh, and he will be at the head of an, a large network of Roman Catholic, semi-Roman Catholic, uh, semi-Protestant and Protestant people all there uh, in, in Naples. Listen to these, these names. I'm sure you've heard of some of these names. In the, what's called the Valdez Circle, we'll have people like Bernardino Ochino, uh, Pietro Carnesecchi, uh, Peter Martyr Vermigli actually will be there, uh, Marc Antonio Flaminio. There will be important women such as uh, Julia Gonzaga and Isabel Bersenia, several bishops and several cardinals such as Gasparo Contarini, 
Reginald Pohl and, Jaco uh, and Jaco Jacopo Sadoletto. Uh, he's the one who had correspondence with Calvin. Um, that's Naples. Uh, Frankfurt, their presence goes back to the mid-1550s. Uh, this is an interesting story because um, the, this is part of the diaspora, Bloody Mary, um, uh, people coming over from London, from England, uh, finding safe haven in Frankfurt. Uh, and a, a French-speaking church will start uh, in, in Frankfurt, and it will be head by uh, Valeran Poyen, but it will be co-pastored by three Spaniards, by Juan Murillo, Luis Hernandez, Diego de la Cruz, and also Juan Perez de Pineda. He will be there as well. Later, Cassiodoro de Reina, I'll, I'll speak of him later, Cassio de Reina, he'll become a member of this church. Uh, these pastors, these Spanish pastors, co-signed, and they probably helped uh, write the Frankfurt Liturgy and the Doctrinal Statement. Um, that has been translated into English, by the way, and that is very fascinating uh, reading. Uh, later, Pineda will become the pastor of this church after, after Puyan leaves. Another uh, Protestant uh, community would be in Geneva. They go back to the 1540s. And in 1558, this is an important date for the Spanish Reformation. In 1558, the first Spanish Protestant church is founded. Now, what I mean by that is it's a, it's a clearly Spanish Protestant church founded as a Spanish Protestant church where they speak Spanish. Um, there were other churches where they spoke other languages, where there were some Spaniards there. In Spain, there were underground churches, uh, what they called the, the, I'll say one Spanish phrase, the Iglesia Chiquita, the, the, the little church inside the bigger church. They met in houses and in convents and in monasteries. Um, but this is the first church that was founded at, by Spaniards to be a Spanish church. Um, and uh, John Calvin uh, himself uh, invited Juan Pérez de Pineda to come and uh, found this church because there were so many Spaniards fleeing Spain to Geneva that he saw the need for that. Um, if you are looking for a PhD thesis, if you are a researcher who knows very well Geneva archives, um, will you help us find their doctrinal statement if they wrote one? Will you help us find their liturgy? Will you help us find their church minutes? We don't know a lot about the Spanish church in Geneva. We do know some things, but we would like to know so much more. Who was there? What did they believe? What did they do? Behind the scenes, are there any letters? Um, Juan Perez de Pineda, as the pastor there, he will begin to publish several books from Geneva um, to help not only his uh, Spanish-speaking church in Geneva, but also with the intent of getting them smuggled into Spain. Um, they are, there is still hope that Spain could turn Protestant, or at least there's the, uh, it's a long shot, but there's still the hope that it, that it can be. And he's writing specifically pastoral works. He's translating the Bible into Spanish. He's writing catechisms. Um, he's doing, uh, writing, uh, uh, publishing commentaries. All of this is uh, e e ecclesiological, uh, ecclesiologically focused uh, publications. Uh, Juan Pérez de Pineda is another author that we don't know a lot about. We do have some of, we do have his works, at least a, a good number of them, uh, maybe a handful or so, but we do not have his letters. We have a couple of his letters, but not many, and we are certain that he had a, a broad correspondence with many people. We don't know. Are you interested? Do you, do, do you know, do you handle these things well? His Latin name was Pierius, Pierius, P-I-E, R-I-U-S. Uh, if there's an expert out there, if there's a researcher out there, if there's a PhD student out there looking to uh, uncover some amazing documents, if they're found, this is a PhD thesis waiting for you. They'll also go to Aragon and Navarra. That is the right on the border there where the Pyrenees uh, Mountains are, uh, right there. Right into France, these were independent kingdoms, um, and they... Uh, they will also go into these little independent kingdoms. Um, <clears throat> again, several names there. I won't further elaborate that. Uh, down here in brackets, I have Francisco de Encinas because he's not technically part of Alcala's diaspora, but I don't know where to put him, so I put him down here. So he's not at all really connected to Alcala, but just real briefly, his story. Um, 
he'll actually uh, flee Spain. He was born in Burgos in northern Spain, and he'll flee to uh, Wittenberg. He will live with uh, Philip Melanchthon, and it is Melanchthon who will encourage uh, Encinas, Francisco de Encinas, to translate the Bible into Spanish. And he'll get the New Testament done, and he will actually hand deliver, personally deliver, a his Spanish translation of the Bible to the Emperor Carlos. Uh, here in Spain, he's called Carlos V. I believe in the English-speaking world, he's called the, the first. But he will hand deliver it to him. Uh, Carlos will then hand it over to his confessor, uh, who will then say this is heresy, and they'll lock up and see us, who will then escape. And he will travel all over the world, and he'll continue to write. He translated um, into Spanish Luther's on Christian liberty and Calvin's institutes in the same work. And this is, again, the, the ecumenical nature of, of Spanish Protestantism. They're not clearly card-carrying Lutherans. They're not clearly card-carrying Reformed. Uh, they, they, they want to circumvent that division. He was good friends with um, Juan Diaz. Just a brief word about Juan Diaz. Juan Diaz also fled Spain. Um, <clears throat> he was from central Spain. And uh, he became good friends with Martin Bucer, the reformer, and again, another ecumenical reformer that, that uh, Spaniards will latch on to. With Martin Bucer, uh, Juan Diaz will attend the Second Colloquy of Regensburg in 1546, which we all know was, was, a, was a failure. And then he will be assassinated by his own brother. His brother finds out that he's at this colloquy and that he's with the Protestants, and to preserve the, his family honor, he will have his brother killed by one of his henchmen. And his story will become famous throughout all of Western Europe as, the, uh, as emblematic of the um, barbarous nature of Roman Catholicism. So uh, now we're going, we were in Alcala, we saw the diaspora, Alcala is in central Spain. We're gonna go now down to Southern Spain. Uh, during the years 1530s to 1550s, Seville and Santi Ponce. Santi Ponce is a little uh, suburb of, uh, of Seville. And if you can see my mouse, I'm not sure if you can. This is a painting from the 1580s of Seville. Here in the middle is the cathedral. And then right across the river, right here, you can barely make it out. This is the monastery. When we talk about uh, Santi Ponce. This is the monastery. This is where I live. I live in Santi Ponce, and that's where the monastery is. Um, so this is also part of Alcala's diaspora, but it, they went to Spain instead of leaving the country. Why did they go to? Uh, why did they go to Seville? Why did they go down south? Well, the archbishop of the time was uh, a big admirer of Erasmus. He was a humanist, and he was attracting. Uh, some of Alcala's uh, best and brightest to come down and become uh, professors and preachers uh, in the cathedral. And we speak of the triumvirate uh, that went down there. Three famous uh, professors, uh, Francisco de Vargas, Juan Hill, and Constantino de la Fuente. Now, another uh, individual, Pedro Alejandro, also went down, but he died shortly after arriving. So these three men will arrive right around the year 1533. Francisco de Vargas was the professor of Scotism in Alcala. Uh, Juan Hill was the professor of Thomism in Alcala, and he will become the cathedral preacher, uh, a very important post uh, in Seville and beyond, and he will become the major uh, figure in Spanish Protestantism. He'll become a preacher. He will go and preach in the convents, uh, he will preach in the school of the doctor, uh, uh, an, an orphanage uh, school for teaching scripture to children. Obviously, in the cathedral, he preaches regularly. Uh, he's, his name is all over the Inquisition records. And thirdly, Constantino de la Fuente. He was the famous. He was another famous preacher. After Juan Hill is arrested and after his death, he will become the the preacher at the cathedral. Uh, he was so famous that uh, before he became the cathedral preacher, he was uh, Philip II, Prince Philip II's personal chaplain, uh, and uh, traveled with him to the Netherlands. That we know of, he's the only one of the three who wrote books, and if the other two did write, their works haven't gotten to us. If you know of these works, 
please let me know. We would love to read works written by Francisco de Vargas and Juan Hill. Um, he would write primarily catechisms. Um, and one of his catechisms, called the Summary of Christian Doctrine, was prized by Roman Catholics. Uh, we know that it was taken uh, immediately after publication. It was taken to Mexico, where it became the basis for uh, further catechisms in Mexico. Uh, but it was also prized by Protestants. Uh, Juan Perez de Pineda will take this book and uh, tweak it a little bit and republish it as a new catechism fit for Protestants. And this really fittingly illustrates someone like Constantino and the broad ecumenical Catholic mainline uh, position that uh, Spanish Protestantism took. He could be adapted to Roman Catholicism. He could be adapted to Reformed Catholicism or what we call Protestantism. Uh, another important figure is uh, uh, Juan Perez de Pineda, a follower of Juan Hill, and he became the director of this orphanage, uh, orphan school that I was re referencing earlier, uh, which, which is called the Children's School of Christian Doctrine. Uh, there they, they taught scripture to the children, and probably other topics as well, but it's probably from this experience that people like Constantino and Juan Perez de Pineda and others had with this school it probably came out of that that they wrote all of their catechisms. Uh, I'd also like to mention two convents. I won't uh, go too into depth, but St. Paula's convent and St. Isabel's convent uh, both had uh, several uh, uh, nuns who were processed by the Inquisition, and many of them uh, very, very bravely did not um, recant their Protestant beliefs, and many of them were um, very heavily punished, severely punished by the Inquisition, and uh, some of them uh, died uh, by burning in the autos de fe, which I will speak of later. <clears throat> so this is Seville. If we go just to the suburb into Santi Ponce, uh, we know from uh, the historical uh, records written from the time that around the 1540s, there was some kind of a revival that broke out in the monastery headed up by Garcia Arias. He's also known as the uh, Maestro Blanco, which is just the, the white teacher, um, but also headed up by Cassiodore Reina and Antonio de Coro. They will be important leaders uh, and we'll speak more of them later. What did this reform consist of? Well, it, well there was a renewed emphasis on scripture, uh, on scripture reading, on scripture exposition. Uh, they stopped praying for the dead. They stopped venerating images. Um, they no longer evoked indulgences or pardons. And then the last thing that they left behind was the monk's habit, that is the, their, their, their clothing, um, the, the, the tonsure, the shaving of their head, and then the mass. Those were the last things that they, that they left behind. There were about, at that time, about 40 monks in the monastery, and half of them became Protestant, including Casiodo de Reina, Cipriano de Valera, and Antonio de Coro. So this is southern Spain. This is still part of Alcala's diaspora. Let's go to, to northern Spain. This is not part of Alcala's di diaspora. This is a, an independent <clears throat> movement that happened up there. Um, <clears throat> and this image here is of the Auto de Fe, where the <clears throat> heretics are paraded out to be judged and then burned. <clears throat> The leader of this movement <clears throat> was a man by the name of Carlos de Sesso. He was actually an Italian-born uh, leader of the Reformation who moved to northern Spain. And as he was in northern Spain, he took a trip back to Italy, to his hometown in, in Italy, where he was converted. He heard of the preaching of justification by faith, and he said, from that I inferred all the rest. Interestingly, he could have been converted by preachers that had been influenced by Juan de Valdez in southern Spain and Naples, or southern Italy and Naples. Um, in the year 1555, he had a meeting with Juan Hill from Seville. Juan Hill had to travel north to Valladolid. He met with Carlos, uh, and this is an important meeting. Unfortunately, we don't know what they talked about, how long it lasted. Uh, we don't know. What we do know is it seems to have been a friendly, friendly meeting, and this gives us um, maybe a hope that 
what was going on in northern Spain and what was going on in southern Spain were at least connected by a similar spirit. And when we read the Inquisition documents, uh, we do find them protesting the same things and preaching the same things. I say this to say, as hard as it was to be a Protestant in Spain during the first half of the 16th century, it does seem to be, at least to some extent, that we can speak of a united uh, Protestant movement in Spain, as opposed to completely several independent movements that don't know anything about each other and that believe different things, radically different things about fundamental topics. Um, <clears throat> he will also be uh, tortured by the Inquisition. He'll be arrested and tortured, but he will not retract his Protestant beliefs. And as a result, he will also be burned alive in an auto de fe in 1559. And what you're seeing here is an auto de fe. Um, the next two names, Agustin de Casaya and Bartolome de Carranza, I won't speak much of them. I only put them here because if anyone does any popular reading of the Reformation in Spain, these names frequently come up, especially in Northern Spain. Uh, Agustin de Casaya was a very important figure, a very important preacher, another personal chaplain of Prince Philip II, but he was only Protestant for a period of a few months. So he did have some influence, but not much, and he ended up retracting his faith um, after being uh, caught by the Inquisition. Uh, and in return for confessing his faith, or excuse me, for repenting, uh, he will be choked to death before he's burned. Um, and Bartolome de Carranza, he was most likely never a Protestant. Uh, there, was, uh, there were rumors of in his day that he was, but he probably wasn't. And I bring that up to steer you away from those rumors. And just like we saw in the South, in the North, there were uh, two convents. And actually, I believe that we could increase that to third. There was at least a, a, a one nun from a third monast uh, convent uh, that was Protestant. But we find uh, uh, groups of Protestants in these convents um, as well. They will be persecuted by the Inquisition. They'll be detained. Uh, processed, uh, held for several months, some of them in solitary confinement, and many of these uh, brave women also will be uh, burned for their Protestant beliefs. 1557, we've made it now through the first 50 years or so. This is the year that everything changed in, uh, in Spain as far as, as far as Spanish Protestantism is concerned. I referenced earlier that from Geneva, Juan Pérez de Pineda was writing, uh, and he was the intent was to send books back to Spain. And he wasn't the only one doing this. People from Paris, people from Geneva, and others. They were trying. They had uh, created an underground network of, of smuggling Bibles uh, and Protestant literature into Spain. And the person who was in charge of the smuggling, his name was Julian Hernandez, and he's known popularly as Julianillo, little, 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 little Julian. Um, and he had made um, two, three, four, maybe more of these trips between, uh, let's say, France uh, and Spain. Um, and, but on one of his trips, uh, which would have been, would prove to be his last, uh, he accidentally delivered the wrong book to the wrong person. What was the wrong book? Well, it's called The Image of the Antichrist by Bernardino Ochino from the uh, Juan Valdez uh, circle in Naples. And this is the image on the cover. This is the Pope bowing before Satan to receive his power. Uh, he delivered it to the wrong person because they, it, he, this person had the same name uh, as the person he was supposed to deliver the book to, but this person was a devout Roman Catholic. Uh, this individual opened the book, was immediately scandalized by what he saw, and immediately uh, delivered it to the Inquisition. Um, before this year, before this event in 1557, Spanish authorities did not know that there were large numbers of, Spaniard, of, of Protestants in Spain. They were horrified to find it, completely shocked. Um, Carlos, the uh, Emperor Carlos, by this time he had retired and he had come back to Spain to end his years. 
Um, and he wrote a letter to his son, uh, now the emperor, uh, King Philip II, telling him to fix the problem in Spain or else he would come out of retirement and fix it himself. Um, this led to what are called autos de fe, hundreds of arrests um, and dozens of Protestants, along with others, Jews and, and Muslims, at least historically, they will, all, they will be martyred for their faith. Um, if you recanted, you were given a lighter sentence, maybe a lifelong penance. Maybe you had to wear what's called a San Benito for the rest of your life, which is just a, um, it's a vest with your sin written on it. Um, if you were a cleric, you were, instead of being burned alive, you were strangled. Uh, but those who did not recant, um, were, they had flames painted on their San Benitos and they were uh, burned alive. The year 1557 marks the beginning of the end for Protestantism in Spain. And between the handful or so of autos de fe between Seville and Valladolid between 1559 and 1562, this is the end of Protestantism in Spain. But 12 monks escaped from Santi Ponce. Now, other Protestants will flee Spain before 1557 and after 1557, but this is by far the most famous flight of Protestants from Spain, and it's really emblematic of the end of the possibility of Spanish Protestantism in Spain, and that they're, 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 they're leaving. What's the story behind this flight? Well, it's really just a stroke of luck. There were many monks living in this monastery. By the way, I should say this, this is the monastery. This is where, uh, this is in our town. This is the, the San Isidoro del Campo Monastery. And um, half of them were convinced Protestants and 12 of them, uh, fully convinced Protestants, could no longer live here. In the year 1557, months before uh, Julian Hernandez accidentally delivered the wrong book to the wrong person, they couldn't live here anymore, and they decided to flee for Geneva. They will, from Geneva, travel all around Western Europe where they will become pastors, theologians, authors, uh, and they will contribute to other reformations and as well as long to return to Spain. Uh, they will go to Geneva, they'll go to London, they'll go to Aragon and Navarre, they'll go to the Spanish Netherlands, especially Antwerp and Frankfurt. If you know of any small communities of Spanish Protestants in any other towns, uh, please get in touch with me. I, we are discovering new Spanish communities uh, all the time, and uh, we'd love to find another uh, small community. So of these 12 monks, allow me to briefly share with you uh, three of them. First and most famously, <clears throat> Cassiodora de Reina. He'll be ministering in exile from about the 1560s until about the 1590s. Um, this is the only known painting of him that was done uh, during his lifetime, and it is in a nursing home uh, in Germany, where uh, Frankfurt, I believe, where he will end his days, and he helped establish um, um, uh, what we would call um, a, uh, a charity. Um, so even though he went to Geneva, he actually saw it as the new Rome. That's what he called it. Uh, why did he call it that? Well, he really struggled with Geneva's use of violence uh, in, in handling Miguel Servetus. He was much more of the line of Sebelian, uh, Sebastian Castellio and uh, Liberty of Conscience. Uh, he was also frustrated with the preaching in Geneva. He said that they spend more time denouncing the Pope than they do preaching evangelical uh, Christ-centered messages. And so uh, he'll end up leaving Geneva and he will uh, travel around, around Europe. Uh, he will become uh, the pastor of a Reformed church in London maybe doing some pastoring in Strasbourg, where Johannes Sturm and Johann Marbach, the Lutheran pastor, were at at the time. 
He'll also pastor Lutheran churches. So he's pastored Roman Reformed churches. Now he's going to be pastor Lutheran churches uh, in Antwerp uh, and Frankfurt. He'll take over in Antwerp. He'll take over uh, Matt, uh, Matthias Fla uh, Flaccius's church. He was truly um, a Catholic Protestant, and I mean that in the ecumenical sense. Uh, he did not like to condemn other Protestants in his writings. Um, the first draft of his Confession of Faith that he had to write to start the church in London in 1560, 1561, uh, it did not condemn other, other Protestants. Uh, unlike other Confessions of Faith, they would condemn Reform or con would condemn Lutheran, vice versa. Everyone would condemn the Anabaptists. He did not condemn any Protestants. Uh, in fact, the first draft of his Confession of Faith uh, did not have anything uh, relating to pedo or credo baptism. Uh, other Reformed churches said, you need to say something about this, and he ended up writing a very soft statement on pedo baptism. Um, now, I'm not saying that he was himself a credo Baptist, but what I am saying is that he had a larger vision. He did not want to exclude Anabaptists uh, or credo Baptists from the church. He just did not want to do that. And then most notably, throughout this 30-year career that he will have, He'll have famous debates with people on the Lord's Supper, and he will time and time again come back to the Wittenberg Concord of 1536, Bucer's perhaps one of his greatest achievements, and he will defend the Wittenberg Concord as a way of uniting Lutheran and Reformed. Um, and so again, when I talk about the fourth way of Spanish Protestantism, this large view of Christianity, uh, uh, it's, it's a beautiful vision. Um, and uh, allow me to uh, a digression here. I say this all the time to students and, and other people. If you live in England, you can be a confessional Protestant. You have the 39 articles. If you live in Belgium, you've got the Belgian Confession. You, ha you have your own documents. If you live in France, you've got, you know, the French Confession of Faith. In Germany, you've got Reformed and Lutheran statements there. Spain, until now, we, we don't think about this. We all have to import our confessions of faith from other places. But we do have Reina's confession of faith from 1560 or 1561. And a thought that I've had is could Spaniards adopt this as their confession of faith to be a confessional Spanish Protestant? Uh, and so help me study this confession of faith. I, along with a friend, we translated this into English and we self-published it on Amazon. You can buy it for, I think, five or six bucks on Amazon. Uh, help us study this confession of faith. Is this a good confession of faith? Is it, does it have staying power? Will it be here in 500 years? Um, if you're looking for a PhD thesis, if you're a scholar looking for, and, and, and you know, uh, 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 Reformed Confessions of Faith, Protestant Confessions of Faith, uh, this would be a great uh, confession to add to, uh, to your study. Secondly, Cipriano de Valera, he stayed in London for most of his life, uh, and then in 1558, with the invasion of the Spanish Armada, he will become, become involved in uh, religious and political affairs, and which is when he will begin to write. Uh, he was Reformed and Puritan. He translated John Calvin. He translated William Perkins. Uh, and he updated uh, Reina's Bible. Um, Reina, he, he was most famous for translating the Bible, but Valera updated it. And when he updated it, he just took the apocryphal books, put them together, and said these are clearly apocrypha. So he's a clearly Reformed person, he's, and he he's, has Puritan tendencies. Nearly his entire corpus, his translations and his original works have been, trans, uh, have been found in the New World. Uh, one of the very few Spanish Protestants whose works made it to the New World. Um, we do not have his letters. We don't know very much about Valera. What we, the few things that we can get are from his prefaces, uh, from... Uh, references to him and other historical documents, but we don't have his letters. If you are looking for a research project, if you handle letters well, if you know London archives well, uh, and you want to get involved in the Spanish Reformation, uh, look for Cipriano de Valera. He had another pen name, 
uh, which was Guillermo Massan. Guillermo Massan. And so if you do want to do this, uh, get in touch with me and keep me informed on, on your progress. He also will travel to Amsterdam, one of the few times he left London, to publish his Bible. And a large, one of those questions we have is, why did he leave London? Why did he go to Amsterdam? How long was he in Amsterdam? That's the last news we have of him. We don't know when he died or where he died. Um, so if you are an expert on Amsterdam and the Reformed community there, what do we know? Did he go over there to pastor? Was there, were there more Spanish Protestants there? Um, how was his Bible received? All these questions. And finally, Antonio de Coro. He was a Reformed uh, a man who became uh, Anglican, and he refused, during his, his Reformed years, he refused to sign the Belgian Confession because uh, it condemned the Anabaptists. So again, this fourth way of Spanish Protestantism. I'm not saying that Antonio del Coro was a cradle Baptist, but what I am saying is that he did not want to exclude uh, Anabaptists from the church. He was an Oxford professor from 1557 to 1586. Um, and his letter to the Lutheran Church in Antwerp, which is available in an English translation online, it was, uh, you, can, you can find it. Um, he was writing to the Lutheran Church. He was the pastor of the Reformed Church, and he was writing to the Reformed Church. Uh, Mat Mat Matthias Flacius was the pastor of the Lutheran Church. And his, the theme of this letter is, let's celebrate what we have in common, and let's not fight about what we don't have in common. And so again, this uniting tendency in Spanish Protestantism. So this lecture here is about the first 100 years of Spanish Protestantism, but let's just real briefly take a look into the 17th century and really just the first half of the 17th century. Unfortunately, there seems to be very little continuity between the 16th century Spanish reformers and 17th century Spanish Protestants. Spaniards will end up losing their identity as Spaniards, and they will just be absorbed into other denominations, especially Anglican and Reformed. Um, as I said uh, earlier, Valera's works will make it into the New World at the beginning of the 17th century. I have a theory on who did that, in case anyone is interested. Uh, Hadrian Saravia, uh, you may have heard of him. I don't think, even though one of his parents was Spanish, I don't think he really counts as a Spanish reformer. He seems to have preferred French and Dutch speaking churches uh, over Spanish speaking churches, but technically one of his parents was uh, Spanish. He will help translate the King James Bible in 1611. Uh, Tomas Carascón will translate the Book of Common Prayer into Spanish in 1623. Uh, Juan Aventrut will translate the Heidelberg Catechism into Spanish in 1627. And Vicente Joaquin Soler will become Spain's first uh, Protestant missionary, where he will uh, go to Brazil in 1636. So, Spain's Forgotten Reformation. Have you been informed? Uh, I hope so. I hope that uh, you heard a lot of new names, a lot of new places. Um, I hope that this has been informative. Uh, and if that's all I accomplished tonight, then that has truly been an honor for me to be the one to introduce you to this tragic but beautiful uh, story. Have you been tempted to help recover Spain's lost reformation? Uh, do you want to help us find our lost works? Do you want to help us interpret Spanish theology and spirituality? Do you want to help us compare and contrast it with other Spanish or with other Protestant traditions? Uh, and have you been inspired by the Spanish Reformation's fourth way of Protestantism? Um, it's not perfect, as no Christian tradition is. But uh, I think it may offer us, uh, provide us with um, a new way to imagine the possible unity uh, in a Protestantism that is divided. So thank you very much, and I look forward to interacting with your uh, questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Mesmer. That was very informative and thought-provoking. Um, so we are going to take a three-minute break at this point. Um, 
keep dropping your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we've got a good number of them already, so that's great. Just keep um, putting them there as you think of them, and then we will be back at 5.03 for Q&A. All right, let's get started on um, our Q&A. We have a lot of questions, so that's great. Lots of engagement, but um, I'm guessing we won't be able to get to all 24 of these. Um, so thank you everybody for your questions. Would I be able to, as, will my email address be shared? Yes, I absolutely okay. can. So I, I would love to do some kind of follow-up. Um, so some of these questions are along the lines of, I would love to read more, where can I find your books, do you have a sub stack, that kind of thing. So okay. um, maybe we can talk about how best to get that out to people, whether sure. email, um, I'll definitely tweet it out at least. So okay. what beyond that we can figure out. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, great, okay, so uh, this seems like a good one to start with. So if Anglicanism is the middle way or third way between Lutheran theology and Reformed theology, how is the Spanish Reformation a fourth way? That is, how is the fourth way distinct from the third way? This is a question from your German colleague in Peru. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, so I have an article published in the Ad Fontes Journal on this topic, uh, the fourth way of Spanish Protestantism. I forget the exact title, but the, the the image I'm trying to get is that Spanish Protestantism was just as broad as Anglicanism in trying to embrace both Reformed and Lutheran thought, but it was even broader than Anglicanism in that it was also open to certain Anabaptist theology, not the real crazy stuff, but not wanting to condemn uh, cradle baptism, to taking very seriously um, uh, uh, one's uh, the, the, um, uh, spirituality and, and piety and um, the, 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 that Anabaptist emphasis. So it's a, it's a bit broader than Anglicanism, and I'm calling it the, span, the, the, the fourth way. I'm playing with the third way of Angli Anglicanism. Email or something, we can include the link to that article. Sure. Um, That'd be great. Um, so uh, here's one. Do you know of any traces of influence of this fourth way Protestantism in Latin America? Uh, no, I do not. Um, now, I'm not an expert on Latin America, but let me just give a few thoughts here. Um, that I know of, the only Spanish Protestant works that made it to the New World were uh, Constantino de la Puente's, his one work, his one catechism, uh, almost the entire corpus of Cipriano de Valera's works, uh, Reina's Bible, and another work called, um, written by Tomas Carascon. What we take from this is that um, in um, Mexico, uh, if there is any influence, it would be from Constantino de la Fuente, and I'm not sure... I don't think that that would really have that, there would be much, I don't think it would be fair to call that what, I, what I've been calling the fourth way. Um, and then Valera, and he's really the only other major author, Valera, he was strictly reformed, very clearly reformed, and I don't think he would have been open to, well, I, I don't know if that'd be fair, but of the people that I mentioned, he would be probably the most, the clearest example we have of like a card-carrying reformed person. Um, so, um, yeah, I couldn't comment on that much more, but, um, yeah, I guess I'll just have to leave it there. I'll, I'll have to think about that a little more, but I, I'm not an expert on that either. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so here's one kind of on the Spanish Inquisition in general. So in Bearing False Witness, Rodney Stark tries to set the record straight regarding the Spanish Inquisition. Among other topics, he claims have been mishandled by generations of anti-Roman Catholic historians. Um, so is this something you've kind of looked into? And um, he asks specifically, what's a good source for a balanced treatment of the Inquisition? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I'm not an expert on this. I have done some read on the Inquisition, and one of my friends, her name is uh, Doris Moreno, she is an expert on the Inquisition. I don't think her works are translated into, uh, into English. If this, the person with this question reads Spanish, I would say 
anything you can read by Doris Moreno would be a good place to start. Um, so I, I don't know if I would, ex I, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would exactly uh, accept that because I have read uh, works on the Inquisition in Spanish and in English that seem to be fairly fairly balanced. Um, so I'm not sure if I if I would agree with 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 uh, Rodney Stark or, or whoever wrote that. Uh, I'm not sure if I would agree with that entirely. Um, but um, yeah, I mean it. when you look at it from a Protestant perspective and when you look at the effects that it had in Spain, I, I think it's a little hard to exaggerate how, just how bad it was for everyone. I mean, there, Spain really had it hard for, for a few centuries there. Um, so I, 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 I guess I'd have to talk about this more with the person who has this question, but um, yeah, I would say start with Doris Moreno and I'm not quite sure if I would agree that that has been really mis really mishandled. Yeah, there are popular treatments who have all sorts of uh, you know exaggerations, but I mean it it was really bad. People really were burned alive. Um, people really did lose all that they had on rumors uh, based on rumors. I mean it, it was it was not fun, and the effect that it had, the social effect that it had on scaring everyone, uh, it was it was real, and that and that consequences lasted for centuries. So. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then another one about the Spanish Inquisition. Do records from the Spanish Inquisition give any indication of exactly what Protestants believed in regard to specific doctrines? Um, like, wh which were the core doctrines that provoked that response from the Spanish Inquisition? Soteriology, sacramentology, iconography, etc.? Uh, yes, they do uh, preserve them very clearly. That is, I guess, if you can say anything nice about the Inquisition, is that they were very meticulous in recording exactly what they said. So we don't have books written by many of these people, but we do have their very words. And they do write down very carefully uh, what, what they were against. And the, the person who asked this question hit on some of the topics. It, what, they were classical Protestant issues. Uh, they were uh, soteriology and ecclesiology. And what I mean by that is they were, uh, they, they, they clearly, time and time again, justification by faith alone, not by works, that comes up over and over again, and all the related doctrines to that, uh, purgatory, um, inv invoking the saints, um, you know, all, all those related to that, and then uh, ecclesiology, uh, not venerating Im images. And in Spain at that time, it seems to have gone beyond venerating, and I'm using technical language here, it seems to have gone beyond venerating and into worshiping. It was not just venerate. There, there's real something extreme going on in Spain, at least from the records that we have. Um, uh, they would uh, stop praying to the saints. Um, and they, uh, Eucharistic theology, they said uh, that Christ was not physically present in, in the Eucharist. They would say there were only two sacraments, not seven. Some of them would say that there were three uh, with uh, confession being the third one. So we have some Lutheran influence, some Reformed influence. Uh, so yeah, it was all the stuff related to soteriology and to um, ecclesiology. And this is, this is clear. There are articles written on this. This They, they were clearly Protestants. Okay. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is an interesting one. So with the developments of Spanish liturgies, were there interesting developments in the musical practices of these early Spanish Protestant churches? Um, example, after uh, the Council of Trent, polyphony was phased out. Was Luther's inclusion of folk songs and hymny, hymnody, or, or did that find its way into the fourth way Spanish Protestants? Or have you looked at music in general? Do you have any comments on the musical practices? Great question. I love this question. I wish we had more information. We don't. Uh, so let me tell you what we do have. We know of two impartial uh, Psalters that were translated into Spanish. Uh, one we've known about for a long time. It was translated by someone named Juan Lequesne in 1602, I think is the date. Uh, we don't know who it is. It could be a pseudonym. It could be his real name. It's impartial. It's not complete. I think it has around 70 Psalms translated. Uh, interestingly, though, it did rhyme now, and not all Psalters rhyme, but this one rhymed. I'm not sure where that comes from, um, but the, 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 the second Psalter was from the uh, 1620s. L literally, 
and I mean this literally, we just found this Psalter five years ago, I think it was. The first article ever published on it was about five years ago, maybe not even five years ago. Uh, one manuscript, it was never even published. It was written by a Spaniard hoping to get into the good graces of the King of England, uh, who at that time wanted more Spanish works. He wanted the liturgy translated, and this individual apparently was hoping he wanted a Psalter translated. He translated about 50. These also rhyme. Uh, so it's, it's aesthetically, it's, it's, it's pleasing, but we just found this. It's never even been published before. So that's what I mean. There, are, there is so much to, that, that we are still uncovering that we, we're asking help on. So as far as music is concerned and Spaniards, very few Spaniards actually made it all the way to Germany. Most Spaniards, when they fled Spain, they go to France, they go to Geneva, they go to England, they go to low countries, but very few actually made it all the way over to Spain. They'll pass through or to, to Germany. They'll pass through it. Some of them did make it, but most people, most Spaniards, they'll become either Reformed or Anglican, and a lot of them will become Reformed, and they'll just adopt whatever practices they had there. So that's what, from the little bit we can reconstruct of the liturgies, they were cutting and pasting with a few adaptations, uh, basically the, the Genevan liturgy and where, where, where that was being incarnated in all the various cities around Western Europe. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of innovation going on, but those two Psalters, there's a lot of study left, uh, to, left to, 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 to be studied on these two and hopefully find some more. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, what is the closest that we have to a distillation of doctrinal truth that captures the small c Catholicity of the Spanish reformers? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I would probably say uh, if I, I, this is referring to like a text, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. um, I would say there's probably three. Uh, it would be Juan de Valdez, his uh, dialogue on Christian doctrine, 1529. And that's going to set you between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. But it seems to, you see, you have to, you have to be, you have to have empathy for these people because when Juan de Valdez wrote this, uh, the Spanish Inquisition is there. I mean, he, he had to choose every single word very carefully because he could face serious consequences. And his book was ultimately, uh, I mean, immediately it was banned. Um, and that's with him trying to be, as Catholic as possible, but also Protestant as possible. And the way that he did that actually was by uh, just being silent on Catholic things. He just didn't talk about them. He didn't say anything against Roman Catholicism. He just didn't talk about things he didn't agree with. And he just emphasized all the Protestant stuff. That's one. The other one is um, Constantino de la, de, de la Fuente, his book, uh, his work on the summary of Christian doctrine. That, as I said, was uh, slightly adapted by Roman Catholics, slightly adapted by Reformed Protestants. That's a, that's, uh, that's a distillation of, of kind of the Catholic uh, heart of, of Constantino. And then I would say Cassio de Reina's Confession of Faith. That is very broad. When you get to the, uh, uh, the chapter on the Lord's Supper, you could read it as a Lutheran, you could read it as Reformed, you could also almost read it as Zwinglian. And, hmm. and, and, and say that you, you agree to it. Uh, and again, the first draft of, his, um, of, of the confession on baptism, he didn't even say anything about whether it's infants or adults. Now, that, that, that was put, later, put in later on, but it wasn't there in, in the first place. And he just, he just stays away from controversial topics, and he emphasizes, uh, he keeps the main things the main, the main thing. And you can get that on Amazon. It's, it's translated into English. Okay, great. Um, we'll try to include uh, those books too in our follow-up uh, email or whatever. Um, so does this Spanish Reformation have any uh, direct or indirect connections to colonies of Spain, such as Mexico or the Caribbean, that would trace a sort of Protestant lineage there? Um, yes and no. Uh, and I've already kind of gone over this. Someone was bringing over Valera's works. Now, um, I have a theory on who that is, but I'm still working on it. I'm a little hesitant to share it here. <laughs> um, but someone was bringing over his works, and there was a Spanish Inquisition, and people were being processed by the Inquisition for Lutheran heresy. Now, in the Inquisition documents, whenever you see Lutheranism, it doesn't mean Lutheranism as opposed to Reformed or Anabaptist or Anglican. It just means Protestant. Um, and people were being processed as Protestants. Now, 
were they reading Spanish works? That's that that that's that question is just in its initial phases of connecting Spanish reformers and their printed works and people being processed by the Inquisition as Protestants in the New World. That is just at the beginning phases. So that would be if anyone's out there who this interest and who knows how to handle the sources, that would be absolutely fascinating to study. Um, the only other person that I could bring up would be uh, Vicente Joaquin, uh, sorry, Vicente Joaquin Soler. Uh, he was a Spanish Protestant uh, who made it to Brazil and he was actually on the ground, boots on the ground, Spanish Protestant. More study is needed for him too, to know how influenced he was by uh, Spanish Protestants. There's there's more study to be there. But he doesn't go to the Spanish-speaking part of the New World. He goes to the Portuguese-speaking part of that. So that, you know, uh, stops him from having a greater influence in the Spanish-speaking world. But So that's a great question. Um, and other than the things that I've already said, that, that's the best answer I can give right now. Okay, great. Um, let's see, do we have time for one more two more yeah. okay um, <laughs> okay <laughs> great well <laughs> um, we have a lot which is awesome uh, so is there any indication of how the Spanish reformers reacted to the 30 years war with England uh, and also was there any relationship between Anglicanism and the Spanish and Spanish Protestant Protestantism before or after the war yes um, so yeah I now I'm a bit confused here the 30 I, I I, I can't remember the exact dates of the Thirty Years' War. Um, I, I tell you what, maybe I could ask this person, because I'd like to say a few things about this. Maybe this person could send me an email directly, and mm -hmm. uh, and we could talk about this, because yeah. I'd like to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, yeah, because I, I have to think about it to to make sure that I'm saying the right things, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not going to do that if I just sure. start speaking right now. So yes. uh, if this person could get in touch with me. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So we'll we'll make sure um, he has your email address. So. Okay, thank you. Um, so someone is also asking about um, revival. Was the revival during the Alumbrado movement or anything that was similar to modern day revivals? Okay, um, that's a good question, uh, and it's tricky to answer first because modern day revivals they're all uh, they're all I mean they're all shapes and sizes. Some they're they're still doing the big kind of tent meetings come here and listen to an evangelist and some they're more, you know, street, uh, you know, uh, lots of people individually sharing the gospel with people. So I, that's a little hard to, 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 to answer. If uh, any of those two models were more like Spain, it would be more the second one of, of more of a one-on-one -on -one model. Um, the, but the reason why it's hard to answer is because even though technically for a few decades, it was, um, it was, let's say, legal to have Protestant leanings, it was still very dangerous, very dangerous. And so you do not want to publicize uh, anything that you're doing that smells of Protestantism, and even anything that smells of Erasmianism or humanism. I mean, they're just, you can get processed by the Inquisition, and that you, that never ends up well. You're going to be tortured. You're going to be fined. You're going to lose all of your goods, your, your, your children. The Inquisition would publish, they would punish uh, certain people to the third generation. They would, they would punish your, your grandchildren. Uh, it, you just did not want to call attention to yourself. So revival that did come about, um, it would be more of a, of a, on a hush, hush level. Now I will say this, um, Valladolid in the 16th century only had about 30,000 people, and the best estimates are that about a thousand of them were Protestant. So about maybe three percent of the city were, were they were openly Protestant, but it was all I shouldn't say openly they were clearly Protestant, but it was all underground. The the the, the Spanish authorities had no idea that there were Protestants in the town. So any kind of revival, it was at a hush hush uh, behind closed doors. Uh, level and nothing, nothing big. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, did the members of the Al Al Saka or Al Sala diaspora maintain contact with each other when they spread across Europe? And do we have any um, records of this correspondence? Uh, yes, I mean not absolutely everyone, but uh, they did stay in touch. Uh, firstly, because some of them went to the same city. 
uh, they were there were groups of them in Paris. There were groups of them in Geneva. Um, and we do know that people travel back and forth between these cities. Um, and we have to assume that even though we don't have records, that they roughly found out, oh, there's Spaniards there. Oh, my friend is there. And that they were somehow communicating. We also know that there were plans. Uh, there were there were certain routes that people would take to smuggle books into Spain. There was, there was a, we could call it like a, um, like a mail, a mail system that would go from Paris and that it would uh, collect mail from little places, Geneva, uh, the, 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 um, the, the Pyrenees, and that it would make it all the way down to Seville and that people kind of were staying loosely in touch with, the, with each other. There was uh, the Pony Express. That's what I was trying to think. You can think of like the Pony Express without the pony. It was just kind of a, um, uh, an informal network of people uh, interchanging letters and, and books. So they did keep in touch uh, with each other. Uh, and um, yeah, well now I'm thinking of people now from like the second generation, like we know that Reina and Coro and uh, Pineda, they actually spent several months together in France and they spoke about their Bible translation and, and a book that they all published together and they published it anonymously but that book was called The Arts of the Holy Inquisition, and it was uh, taking the, the blanket off of this awful nest of the Spanish Inquisition and telling the world, this is how awful it is, this is what they're doing, and these are the stories of people who have been processed by the Inquisition. Very famous work translated into all the, all the languages. Uh, I've got the edition back, there's a new critical edition out. So, um, so yes, they did keep in touch with each other. Um, and if you find the letters, please let us know. We would love, love, love to, 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 to have these letters. If you, are, if you uh, handle Latin well um, or French, um, but especially Latin, um, please let us know. We would love to, to, to count, with your, count on your support. Okay. Yeah, great. And actually, that's kind of a good lead into um, what I was going to ask for the last question. So somebody asked... Um, Obviously, you made um, an appeal to anybody who has kind of academic skills and resources who could help with this project. Um, is there anything that a lay person can do, maybe who doesn't have Latin or as many academic resources, but is, is there any um, way for them to get involved or help at all? Yeah, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, one of them is uh, read all you can and become a promoter of the Spanish Reformation. Um, really sit at their feet like you would at Luther's feet or Calvin's feet, um, you know, sit at their feet, learn from them, um, and, you know, promote them, um, uh, you know, help uh, Spaniards. I, I'm assuming most of the people here watching are from America. I'm assuming maybe that's incorrectly, but, uh, you know, help the Spanish speakers there uh, find out about their own roots. Many, many Spanish speakers, uh, they've only heard the names of, of Reina and Valera. They, they've never read their works before. Help them get uh, the Confession of Faith in Spanish, help them get, uh, you know, some of these works in Spanish. Uh, another way is to give to our seminary. Our, our goal here, and I'm, I'm looking out at the part of our seminary, the, the, our library that's dedicated to the Spanish Reformation, but our goal is to become the world center of recovering the Spanish Protestant Reformation, and to do that, we need funding. Uh, so we got, we have some generous gifts from, from, from a few churches in America, but I've gone through most of that. And, but we are, I mean, that is our vision. We want to, this to be ground zero. Uh, let me share one quick story. And so Cassiodoro, uh, excuse me, Cipriano de Valera, he, he was one of the monks that, that, that fled Spain and he wrote a work. And in the middle of this work, uh, he was talking about Seville. He's writing in London, he's talking about Seville. And he said, if God would ever have mercy on Spain, it would only make sense for him to start where we all had to flee from, this monastery in Santi Ponce, that he would turn this place into a university, and from this university, light would go out throughout all Spain. And that's why we're here in Santi Ponce. We still have this vision of turning this monastery and turning this town into a university where we can be a light to Spain and to the Spanish-speaking world. And a lot of it starts with us getting their works back. We want to continue in their tradition. We want to recover their reformation and to take it into the future to the 21st century. So if you want to get involved, a great way would be helping us get, get, get more books. 
that's a great note to close on. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Mesmer, for that fantastic talk. Uh, remember to head over to the Davenant Hall website if you'd like to find out more about the programs and courses we offer. And do head out to um, Dr. Mesmer's web website, which he mentioned earlier, to follow hit the work that he's doing. And we will get some kind of a follow-up email uh, going and uh, for all the questions we were unable to get to and um, with all the resources and books and everything. So uh, thank you, Dr. Mesmer, and thank you everybody for coming. Thank you.